So we're, we're doing this sort of fast-paced run through all of life. Okay, we started with bacterial genes and genomes um, and how we could use those to study uh, lots of interesting things about microbial organisms. Um, we then entered the animal realm and we did a few lectures on dogs. And today, uh, we're going to finish up animals, actually, at this very rapid pace. And we're going to talk about other animals that people study um, and how genomics is used to, to study various things. And, and one of the themes that, that is going to sort of percolate through today's lecture is that by studying a lot of different animals, we learn both about what makes animals similar to one another, the commonalities among all animals, and also uh, about differences between animals. So the questions that we're going to address today are, uh, what does genomics reveal about the features that all animals share? Okay, so if we study enough animals, maybe we'll find the commonalities that make uh, animals alike. Um, and following on the kinds of things we were talking about with dogs, where there are clearly differences between animals that arise, um, and in dogs you saw how quickly those can arise and how different uh, even members of the same species can be. We want to ask the question whether dogs are unusual because they're a domesticated species that humans have had a hand in shaping uh, the evolution of, or if we can actually observe in the wild animals um, evolving as rapidly as the domesticated animals like dogs. And, um, and if so, can we use genomics to understand that evolutionary process? So I want to start with a big, quick overview of all of animals, okay? And so this is an evolutionary tree showing the major animal groups. And uh, animals emerged on the scene on our planet about 500 million years ago. And what's uh, impressive about the fossil record is that, is that before this time, there really wasn't much diversity at all in terms of things that look like animals. But at about this moment in time, a lot of different animals appeared in the fossil record. And, um, and in fact, representatives of all of the major existing groups of animals uh, originated at about this time. That's why it's called the Cam Cambrian explosion. Okay, It's an explosion of diversity that happened about 540 million years ago in the paleontological era we call the Cambrian. And so um, I pointed out several lectures ago how if you look at the evolutionary tree of all organisms, that the ones that are familiar to us are a very, very, very small portion of that tree. So if you, if you remember, there's this big tree of life. And then up in this one little corner is all animals, plants, and fungi, all of those sort of macroscopic things that we think about from day to day. And if you zoom in on any particular part of the evolutionary tree, you can see that pattern repeat itself. So if we zoom in on animals, then we can look for the things that are familiar to us and the things that are unfamiliar to us. And there's quite a bit of unfamiliar territory here. So um, you can recognize uh, things like this dog, or like us, or like a frog, uh, vertebrates, okay, animals with a real backbone. Um, and, and most of the things you think of as an animal would fall either in this category or probably in this category, the arthropods. So arthropods are all insects, crustaceans, so flies, beetles, shrimp, uh, lobsters, that kind of thing. Um, or maybe some of these other categories, mollusks, so things like snails, clams, oysters, other delicacies, um, annelids. OK, uh, things like earthworms, right? But then a lot of these are probably unfamiliar to you. You might know one or two examples of species that belong in some of these other groups. Echinoderms include starfish, sea urchins, that kind of thing. Um, sponges, or periphera, uh, you might not even realize were animals. A sponge that you see as a ma macroscopic thing is actually a community of little animals. Um, Cnidarians, like jellyfish. Okay, And then there's other categories that I didn't even talk about um, of things that you've probably never even encountered, um, like a urochordate or a cephalochordate. And I'll actually introduce you to one uh, urochordate at the very end of the lecture. 
So that's all just to say that there's an amazing amount of animal diversity out there. And people are studying various parts of this animal family tree. Uh, most of the attention, as you might imagine, is focused on the organisms that are familiar to us and that matter to us, things like vertebrates, things like us, right? Things like arthropods, because they're, uh, um, in many ways, uh, the dominant species on the planet. And they are very relevant to human existence in terms of pollinating our crops, uh, causing diseases, and so on. Um, so there is some focus there, but there's also, through um, a lot of biology, but especially a resurgence due to genomics, there's a focus on just the entire range of diversity and different species that exist. Um, and one of the amazing findings of the last 20 years or so is that even though these organisms appear very, very diverse, there is a common sort of genetic underpinning to what it means to be an animal. And so I want to play a really good clip from a PBS documentary called Evolution that, ex that starts to explain this, and then we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. So what do we learn by looking at 600 million years of animal history? Evolution's tinkering with mammalness to make whales. In the same way, it's tinkering with fishiness to make tetrapods. And it's tinkering with animalness to make all the different body plans that we see. All these different creatures are variations of the same theme, restated over and over again. The question was, what was evolution tinkering with? One of the remarkable discoveries of the last 20 years is that evolution's not tinkering with the bodies. It's tinkering with the recipe, the machinery that builds bodies. What is that recipe? What is that machinery? It's the genes. All right, so this last point is really important, right? The idea that if you see in all of these different animals that the same genes are being used for the same things, like the one gene that is triggering eye development in a fly is also triggering eye development in a mouse. And in fact, you can take that mouse gene and put it in a fly, and it will trigger eye development in a fly just as well. What that implies is that um, the common ancestor of all animals, so somewhere around 600 million years ago, w had that gene and was using it to trigger eye development. Right so, right, so that's a good question. The question is, does that mean that every gene that exists today goes back way, 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 way back in time, like to the beginning of all ancestors, uh, all animals? Uh, the answer is no. M most genes do. And if you remember a previous lecture, I gave you sort of the percentages. So like how many genes we share in common with fish and how many genes we share in common with a fly. Um, and the farther out you go, the fewer genes you share in common. But still, a large proportion are shared. Um, and it is true that occasionally a new gene will arise that will lead to a new set of traits that hasn't existed before. Uh, but often, um, the way new traits appear is not by an, a, the appearance of a new gene, but by using an existing gene in a different way. And we'll see examples of that. We'll, we'll see examples of both, actually, in today's lecture. The other thing I wanted to point out, too, um, the reason I was saying, what, what embryo is that? Is that a fly, that's a fly, that's a chicken, you know, um, is because they, they sort of uh, showed these images without really explaining them. And one of the key images they showed was of a needle going into a fly embryo. Did you catch that? Right When they were saying they took the mouse gene and they put it into a fly, um, and they showed this needle going into a fly. So can you do surgery on genes? Can you actually take a needle and pick up a gene? and move it to a different organism? What do you think? Can you or can't you? Left hand, if you think you can, perform surgery at the level of genes and say, I'm going to stick a needle in and pick up a gene. Okay. And right hand, if you think can't. OK, the rights have it, and the rights are right. Um, you can't do that. You can't see genes, right? You know, the whole beginning part of this course was about, well, well, how do you make inferences about DNA, about genes, without actually being able to see these letters, A's, T's, C's, and G's? Um, and so 
you can't actually stick a needle in and pick up a particular gene. Right? Um, in a later lecture, later in the semester, I'll tell you about how you actually do this kind of thing where you transfer a gene from one organism to another organism. But it does not necessarily involve a needle. Okay? Um, and in fact, the job of the needle in that case is not to actually excise a particular gene. The needle might be used as a delivery system for a gene, but it's not actually cutting out a gene. Okay, so, yeah? So how have they figured out that the mouse could develop eyes? So they didn't do that experiment, right? So they did the experiment where they took the mouse gene and they put it into a fruit fly. And I'll, uh, for now, you just have to believe me that you can do that, and it's not that tricky. And you know, when I was in grad school, I had to do it a lot of the times. Okay. Um, in a later lecture, I'll tell you exactly how that works. But um, they didn't do the reciprocal experiment, which is to take the fruit fly gene and put it into a mouse, because that's a longer, harder experiment. Um, the inference is, is that you get probably the same result. And I'll show you a little bit more about the result you get when you do it in flies. Um, you'll see sort of how powerful this one gene is. And then the other question is, well, how do you find these genes in the first place? Right? So you can make a nice movie that says there are these genes that specify different parts of the body. Uh, Dr. Gehring could find the gene that um, triggers eye development, but how do you do it? And, and part of that was hinted at in, in that little clip. The way you find a gene that triggers eye development is you identify a mutant fly, for example, that doesn't have eyes. Okay? And then you infer that whatever gene was mutated was necessary in order for the eyes to grow. Okay, does that make sense? Right. And then um, a similar gene, well, a similar mutant was identified in mice. So there's a, uh, and I'll show you a picture, a picture of it in a second, where the mice develop with reduced eyes. And then it was discovered that it was the same gene. Okay. Um, some of these other genes that specify where the animal is along this body axis were found by even more dramatic and amazing mutations. So uh, one of the classic examples is a mutation in flies called ant antennapedia. And if you break down that word, you have antennapedia. So what, is, what does the root ped mean? Right. So um, basically what these mutants have is legs in the place where, they're there, where their antennae should be. Okay, so these are high power magnified images of a fly head. Okay, so, so the fly is basically looking at you, eye, eye, proboscis, and the antennae are here. Okay, and this is the mutant. And so you can see eye, eye, head, and then instead of having antennae, these are what fly legs look like. Okay, and so these are the kind of uh, mutations that uh, Ed Lewis, who was shown in that clip, was looking at when he was making this proposal that there were individual genes that were specifying parts of the body. Because he could get a mutation where one part of the body was transposed to another part of the body. And that mutation was presumably in a single gene. Okay? So that meant that individual genes had a lot of power to determine where on the body uh, you are. Yeah, so we'll talk about that too. So that's the other good question. And it gets back to this question of why when you take the mouse gene and you put it in a fly, do you get a fly eye as opposed to a mouse eye? Right? So we'll get back to that question. Here's another one of the mutations that uh, Ed Lewis studied. Um, so this is what a normal fly looks like. It has one pair of wings that are in the second thoracic segment. And uh, one of the mutations he studied is something called bithorax, where you get two pairs of wings. Okay, so this, again, is a type of mutation where an entire part of the body is changed by a mutation in presumably a single gene. Okay? So I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, the anatomy of a fly body so we can understand this a little bit more deeply. Um, as you know, flies um, undergo what's called complete metamorphosis. That is, when a fly hatches from an egg, it's a larva. It, that is, it's a maggot-looking thing, a little worm-looking thing that crawls around and feeds. Once the larva is mature, it forms a pupal case, so like a cocoon. 
inside that pupil case, it develops into the adult, and then the adult emerges from that pupil case. Okay? So this is what a, an, a fly embryo looks like um, that will eventually hatch into a larva, and this is what a fly adult looks like. And the segmental pattern along this body axis in the adult is already prefigured in the embryo. So you have a head, you have three thoracic segments, and then you have eight abdominal segments, and you have the same in the adult. Head, three thoracic segments, and eight abdominal segments, and it's a very stereotypical pattern. Every uh, fruit fly you look at looks like this, um, and the wings are always on the second thoracic segment, and uh, there's one pair of legs on each thoracic segment, and so on. Okay? And so the question is, well, how do genes set this up? How, how is it that genes can specify one segment being different from another? Because the inference, of course, is, is that if the wings are always on the second thoracic segment, some gene must be triggering wing development at the right place and time. And so we know a lot about these genes now. Okay? And uh, they, they, under, they go by these different names that we don't really have to worry about. Um, they have this really bizarre property that's not completely understood, which is that the order of segments in the body that they specify is actually the order of the genes on the chromosome. It doesn't have to be that way, but it, it apparently is. And so uh, from, this is actually a map of the chromosome from one end to the other end. And uh, you can see that this gene all the way at this end is involved in specifying uh, head structures. Okay, and as you go this way along the chromosome, you have genes that are specifying more and more posterior structures, that is, structures more towards the tail end. Okay? And together, they cover basically the entire embryo. Right? And so this is what it looks like with these same colors mapped onto the adult. And so you can imagine that if you somehow were able to get a mutation that made this gene, instead of being expressed in the, um, in the second thoracic segment, where a leg should go, if you had that gene expressed in the head, then maybe you would get a leg growing out of an antenna, because this gene has something to do with specifying that a leg should go here. Okay? And so this illustrates a point we've talked about before, which is very important, and especially important in today's lecture, which is that the when and the where of gene activity is really where all the action is. Okay? So when and where genes get expressed has something to do with, with what their function is. And in particular, if you think about an animal developing, then what's probably happening is this gene is acting like a, a manager saying, OK, we're in the second thoracic segment. We need to build a pair of wings, and we need to build a pair of legs. And then there are a lot of foot soldiers or workers or choose your favorite analogy uh, underlings that are listening to that manager and saying, OK, this guy's telling me to, to build a leg. I'm going to build a leg. This guy's telling me to build a wing. I'm going to build a wing. And that's why when you take the mouse gene and you put it into the fly, this, this eyeless gene, and you put it into the fly, the genes that are listening are just hearing build an eye. And they're the genes that are that are going to build a fly eye. You haven't transferred the whole program for building the eye. You've only transferred the manager. And so the manager walks in and says, build an eye. And then all the fly genes are saying, saying OK, we know how to build an eye. We're going to build a compound eye that looks like a normal fly eye. We're not going to build a mouse eye. We don't know how to do that. OK, does that make sense? So, so the other thing that should not surprise you is that all of these genes are transcription factors. OK, all of these genes encode proteins. That is, the genes are not transcription factors. The proteins they encode are transcription factors. So all of these proteins bind to DNA sequences and regulate the activity of other genes. Okay? That's what makes them these managers that can control a large battery of other genes to actually build these organs. Okay? So all of these genes are uh, encoding transcription factors. This eyeless gene uh, encodes a transcription factor. And so here's what that fly eyeless mutant looks like. Normally, you'd have a big red eye right here. And you can see there's only a tiny little vestige of, a, of an eye there. That's what the fly mutant looks like. Um, this is what the mouse small eye mutant looks like. Normally, you'd have a nice little round mouse eye here. Uh, but in the mutant, that's a very, very reduced eye. And as you saw in the clip, 
both of these mutations are in the same gene. That is, when you look at the sequence of the gene, you say uh, there are a few differences between the fly gene and the mouse gene, but those, those sequences are very, very similar. Those are basically the same gene separated by 600 million years of evolution. Okay, that gene's called PAC6, by the way. Um, there's also a mutation that occurs in humans that leads to a condition called aniridia. Okay? So this is a condition where if you're a heterozygote, that is if you get one good copy from one parent and one bad copy from the other parent, um, you have a condition called aniridia where the iris of the eye is missing. Okay? If you're a homozygote, if you have two bad copies of the gene, then you have basically the same kind of phenotype that these that these flies and these mouse have. They have a, basically a missing eye and very severe deformation of the face, the, the craniofacial structures, the, the skeleton of the face. I didn't show you a picture of that because there are very disturbing pictures, very upsetting to look at, pictures of children who are affected as homozygotes of, of a mutation in the same exact gene. If you want to, you can look, at the, look them up yourself, but I chose not to show you a picture of that because it is pretty upsetting. Okay, so the clip said that if you take the mouse gene, the normal PAC6 gene from mouse, and you insert it into a fly, and we're gonna talk about it in a later lecture how you actually do that, but take my word that you can do that. Um, you put it into a fly, and the fly will grow a normal fly eye. Okay, that is these genes are interchangeable. Beyond that, there's something quite amazing about this gene. So in flies, we have all of these genetic tricks where we can not only sort of put the gene uh, activity in its normal place, but we can direct that gene activity to wherever we want it to go, okay? And so one of the things that Dr. Gehring's group did was not to make this um, mouse gene or the fly gene expressed in the primordium of the eye, but to make it expressed in the primordium of other tissues. Okay? And then what you get is an eye developing somewhere else. Okay? So if you make this gene expressed uh, in the developing antennae, you get four eyes. Okay? You get the two normal eyes, and then you get two extra eyes where the antennae would be. If you make this gene express in the developing wing, you get flies with eyes on their wings. Okay? This is a close-up of the antennae. If you make it express on basically what's the fly equivalent of the knee, of the leg, you get an eye on the knee, okay? So this gene is incredibly powerful, right? Just making this gene active in a particular place and time makes all of the other genes that are responsible for eye development wake up and say, okay, we gotta build an eye, okay? And it doesn't matter if that's in the right place or in the wrong place. Right, so that's a good question. Do these eyes work? Um, it's a hard question to answer because you can't ask the fly, yeah. right? Um, but um, just from the histology, so just from looking at this tissue under a microscope, um, it looks like it could be a functioning eye. You know, there's a retina that develops. Um, there are neurons that innervate it. So uh, it's not impossible that um, this would work in some sense whether the fly could somehow use that information, whether it actually gets to the central nervous system in the brain, I don't know. Um, but it's a good question because if you think about it, this is tinkering, right? So in the lab, we can tinker and put an eye on the wing, right? So maybe the same thing could happen as a very rare event during evolution that some fly gets born one day with an eye on its wings. Um, and that may or may not be a good thing. The thing about evolution is it doesn't just have to be cool. It has to help that organism survive and reproduce, right? So it could be that it would be useful to have fly uh, eyes on your wings, okay? But it could be that it would be really detrimental because you can't fly anymore because it's too heavy. You have an eye on your wing. Or because a predator says, hey, look at that red spot there. I'm going to go eat that, right? So in any event, uh, but the, the concept is the same. This is tinkering. This is tinkering in the lab, okay? But it's the same type of thing that might arise just by a random mutation um, during the course of hundreds of millions of years. Okay, 
A little bit more detail about these genes, uh, getting back to the question of whether new genes arise or not. One of the ways new genes arise and can lead to new traits is by duplications of old genes. Okay? And so you can imagine that if there's a gene for develop, deve that's important for the development of the legs and that gene duplicates, then the new gene might actually do something slightly different than the original gene. And so you can maybe start subdividing uh, into more complex uh, anatomical structures. And so uh, that's, in a sense, what's thought to have happened um, in us or in our ancestor, different from uh, the lineage that leads to flies. So in flies, there's this one set of genes. But in us, there's, there's as many as four copies of each of these genes. Okay? And so uh, it's thought that, that ex those extra copies of genes that now have slightly different functions has contributed to the greater complexity of our bodies than of, say, an arthropod body. And that's the usual route by which new genes emerge, as copies of old genes, and then those genes diverge into new functions. Okay? But the same thing that's true of flies, where uh, these genes sort of line up and specify these uh, positions in the, in the embryo that later become the same positions in the adult. That same thing is going on in mice and in us when we develop. Okay? These genes, which are called Hox genes, um, are organized along the chromosome in the same order that they're organized in the developing body. Okay? And in us, there's just approximately, uh, give or take, four copies of each of these. Um, and, and you get maybe a little bit more complexity along this body axis of that. OK, so, so that, that's a very strong statement about the commonality of animal development. Basically, any animal you look at is going to have versions of these genes. And they're basically, in almost all cases, doing essentially the same thing. That is, the genes on this side are, more, are, develop, are involved in the development of more head structures, and the genes on this side are, developing the, are involved in the development of more tail structures. Okay? Um, and that's true if you look at flies, if you look at mice, if you look at us, if you look at frogs, if you look at fish, if you look at basically any animal you can name except some that are very, very uh, weird uh, and uh, maybe parasitic ones. Um, so that's, that's an amazing statement about the commonality of animal development, that basically the same genes are running the show in, in all animals. Um, so that sort of begs the question, well, where do the differences come from? Why is it that flies build a compound eye with 800 individual little eye facets? Um, you probably did this in elementary school where you put a bunch of straws together and looked through it to sort of simulate what it's like to be a fly looking at the world. Um, why does a fly build that kind of eye, and a mouse builds an eye like ours with a cornea and a single lens and a retina that the light focuses on? Um, their differences have to emerge somehow despite all of these commonalities. And in general, I think it's fair to say that those differences are happening in these genes that are listening to the managers, okay? the ones that are listening to these transcription factors. Um, and the problem is it's really hard to figure out those changes. Because if, you, if, you're, if your question is, well, why does a fly build a fly eye and a mouse build a mouse eye, there's hundreds of millions of years of evolution separating those two organisms. And so it's really difficult to try and track the changes that happened that made this eye different from this eye. Because there are not only so many differences in the eyes, but there are also many differences in the genes. Okay? And it's hard to figure out which, which differences in the genes are the ones that actually matter. So instead, what people often do is they look at much more closely related organisms that still have differences between them. And then you can start to understand this process by which a difference in the genetic code can actually change how an organism looks. And that's why people study dogs, for instance. Because dogs are a single species. They're very closely related to each other. right? But still, dogs look very different from each other. Because they're so closely related, we have some hope of figuring out why those differences uh, actually exist. That is, how the differences emerge during development, what genes are involved in those differences, uh, and so on. And so that's why dogs are great to study, uh, because they tell us something that we probably can't 
really studied by comparing mice and flies alone. The problem that's been raised about dogs is that, well, that's a special case. Dogs are a special case. And the reason dogs are a special case is because they have not undergone natural selection in the wild, but they are a product of human intervention. Humans have performed generations of, upon generations of artificial selection on, on dogs. They've said, hey, I like that dog. I want something that's small with curly hair. Uh, and they turn it into a poodle. Okay? Or I like that dog that's really mean um, and barks a lot. I, I want a German Shepherd. Okay? And so maybe that process of artificial selection is very different from the process of natural selection. And so maybe it won't tell us much about how traits like the eyes of flies and uh, mice came to be different from one another. So that was the worry. Um, it didn't worry Darwin, by the way. Okay? If you go and read The Origin of Species, uh, the, the beginning of The Origin of Species is Darwin talking about domestication. Okay? His prime example was not um, dogs. Does anyone know what his prime example was? Pigeons, right? Uh, it used to be common to breed pi pigeons as, as sort of pets and fanciful, fanciful animals. Um, and so that was his major example of how uh, organisms can become different from each other by this process of selection. Okay? And so he actually used that as a major argument for how natural selection works. But still, there's this worry that maybe these are slightly different processes, and we don't really learn about nature by, by studying domestication. Okay? And we'll come back to this again, actually, when we talk about domesticated plants. But for the time being, what I want to introduce you to is an organism that's sort of like dogs in its diversity, except it's completely natural. And that diversity arose in very recent times, about the time scale in which uh, uh, dogs have been evolving but it's by completely natural forces with no human intervention whatsoever. Okay? And that organism is the stickleback fish. Okay? And so what you're looking at here are two different members of the same species, okay? uh, the stickleback fish. Um, their skeletons, that is their bones, are stained with alizarin red. Okay? So you've seen stains before, like hematoxylin and eosin in lab. They're just used to make particular features stand out. Okay, and what alizarin, alizarin red does is it makes bones stand out. Okay? And so you can see there's a huge difference between this fish and this fish. Right? Um, there are several. So one of the big differences is there's a lot less red here than here. Okay? So this fish has much less bone than this fish. The bones in this fish that you see are what's termed armor. Okay? So these are plates, basically, on the fish that make it really tough to chew into. Okay? And you'll see, actually, a video of this uh, a little, in a little bit. Right? So this is an armored fish and an unarmored fish. Okay? The other thing you notice is uh, the reason it's called a stickleback is because it has these spines on its back. Right? And so you can see in this fish, those spines are much reduced. And this one pelvic spine is absent. Okay? And so these differences emerged in very recent time in the same species. So you can cross these two individuals and get progeny that are fertile. These are members of the same species. But they're very different because they've been exposed to very different habitats. And they've, they've adapted independently to those different habitats. Okay? And so these are not the only two members. There are hundreds of different sti stickleback fish. Okay? And basically, their properties are associated with different habitats. So um, there are stickleback fish that live in lakes uh, or streams. There are stickleback fish that are so-called limnetic fish. That is, they live in the open waters of a lake. Or benthic fish. That is, they live on the lake bottom. Okay, so they even partition particular environments. There are freshwater, um, like river and stream fish. And then there are so-called anadromous fish. Anyone knows what anadromous, anadromous means? It's like a salmon that lives in one part of its life in salt water and then goes upstream to spawn. Okay? So there's those kind of fish. They have very different coloration patterns depending on where they're from. And they also have these different uh, bone structures depending on where they're from. 
Okay? So I want to play you a little clip from a Howard Hughes Medical Institute video uh, that will show you a little bit more about these fish and, and why they're so diverse. Okay, so during the, the Ice Age, these huge sheets uh, covering uh, lots of land mass, ice was incredibly thick, so mile-wide mile, uh, thicknesses of ice pile on top of land, and then the Earth starts to warm. So widespread melting of those ice sheets uh, begins, and the glaciers uh, recede, leaving in their wake environments that used to be completely buried under ice but are now exposed. If you go into areas like, for example, around British Columbia, you'll find that the islands around Vancouver are dotted with freshwater post-glacial lakes covered uh, in these formerly ice-covered regions. Those freshwater lakes, if you uh, look in them, very frequently have sticklebacks that have come in uh, from the ocean but then adapted to the local environmental conditions in the lake. That adaptation includes uh, decisions about uh, how to avoid predators this shows a trout trying to eat a stickleback. You can see the sticklebacks sometimes uh, get away, so the armor that they have can be very useful. Sticklebacks are also uh, eaten by insects. And the preying strategy of an insect is actually to reach out and grab onto things like spines of sticklebacks, uh, reel them in, and then uh, munch them uh, from the side. So depending on the kinds of predators that you're uh, uh, encountering in different lakes, it may be better or worse uh, to have or to lose uh, armor. Okay, so the, so the general idea is if you're out in the open ocean, there's probably a lot of predators, and the sort of ancestral stickleback fish is one that looks like this, this marine fish. Okay, it has lots of armor, it has the, the spines on its back. Those are adaptations to trying not to get eaten, probably. Okay. But these fish that arose, uh, that, that colonized and then evolved in these little lakes and streams that were exposed after the last ice age um, are in environments that have uh, sometimes no predators or far fewer predators. Um, and so they lose their armor. Okay, and they lose the, the spines that would protect them also. And as you saw, it might even be a counter pressure that in certain lake environments you have these insects that can grab onto the spines and so if you're a benthic fish that's hanging out on the bottom of a lake amidst all this vegetation and there, there are these insects lying in wait to grab onto you then maybe it's an adaptation to be harder to grab onto and, and so losing these these plates might, might in addition to being a result of not being necessary anymore it might actually be an advantage because you're not even going to get caught by those insects. Okay, So as I said, these are members of the same species, so you can do genetics on them. You can cross them to each other. And by crossing them to each other, you can identify genes that are causing these differences in the fish. And we're going to talk about that a lot more when we talk about plant breeding. Um, but for now, all you have to recognize is that because we can do crosses, we can identify genes. And so, there's uh, a, a number of labs now that are interested in finding the genes that are responsible for, say, the loss of armor or the loss of this spine or the loss of those spines. Right. So, so the question is, um, why why does evolution seem to stop in humans? Or right. Right. So, so this is a debate that goes back a long time. Right. And, and in fact, this question of why don't humans have wings um, is sort of one of the primary examples that's used. Right. But it is one of the examples that people have used for, for a long time to, to debate this question. And there are two schools, of, two schools of thought. One is that maybe you think it might be good, but it actually either by itself or because it precludes some other ability would actually not be beneficial. Right. And so that's, that's sort of a point of view that says, well, all of these changes are possible, especially given enough time. And natural selection has chosen for any particular point in time 
the, the best strategy available to it. Okay? So that's one point of view. The other point of view is that maybe once you have a body as complicated as ours, that changing it to add a pair of wings is not at all trivial okay? um, and may, in fact, be impossible. That is, you might not be able to change our genetic makeup to build wings without messing up many other aspects of our development and therefore leading to you know, inviable human embryos. Okay, so that, that's a point of view that's called developmental constraint. That is, there's, there's some physical and biological limitations on what can actually be produced, and that's why we don't see it. And it's, and it, it's still a question for any particular trait why you wouldn't see it in nature. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that natural selection is not sort of focused, right? Natural selection is not saying, hey, it would be convenient to have a pair of wings right now. Natural selection is sort of summing up all of the, all of the features of an organism. Right? So um, some of those features are going to be a lot more salient than others. There might be a lot more opportunity to change those features in the way that genes work um, than others. And so it's that sum total of everything being selected at once and all of the possible changes that gives you an outcome that you see. Um, for example, certain things tend to keep evolving rather rapidly compared to other things. One of those is sexual structures. Okay? So one of the things my lab studies is sexual differences between flies. And the reason we do it is because if you look at animals um, and you look at very closely related species, the most likely thing to be different about them is something related to sex. And it's thought that the reason is, and this goes back to Darwin also, is that there's this constant coevolution between the sexes that there's um, what's, what Darwin called sexual selection, that males are constantly trying to be more and more attractive to females, and females are constantly evolving to be more and more choosy about males. And so you get this rap these rapid changes in secondary sexual characteristics that you see in practically every animal lineage that you look at. Okay? So those changes are happening rapidly and ongoing. And they might even dwarf you know, the ability to fly right? in terms of the, the selective forces that might be, might be acting at any particular point in time. Well, so yes and no. So it's certainly absolutely true that humans impact the environment quite a bit, right? And so, you know, for example, these glasses I'm wearing, right? If, if I were unable to wear glasses, then, you know, maybe my lifespan would be a lot shorter because I'd sort of wander off somewhere and get eaten by a tiger or whatever, right? So um, our ability to change our own sort of abilities, uh, sort of artificially, aside from biology, definitely impacts our evolution, okay? But that said, you know, humans are still evolving, and one of the ways we're, we're definitely evolving is, is relative to pathogens, okay? And this is true of every organism that's subject to viruses or microbial infections, right? You know, there's this constant coevolution between what's out there and who survives an infection of, of one or another potential pathogens. Um, so despite the fact that we change our environment a lot, we're, we're definitely still, still evolving. And actually, if you think about it, there are lots of organisms that change their environment. Basically, the act of being an animal is changing your environment, okay? Because you're taking in nutrients from the environment, you're giving off waste products, you're reorganizing the environment around you. Um, and so there's no organism that's completely N separate from its environment in the sense that it's not, not engineering its environment. Every organism is basically doing that. We're just doing it sort of, you know, consciously, or maybe not, right? I wish maybe we were a little bit more conscious about how we were changing our environment. Okay, so these are neat fish, right? And, and, and they're a good example of something happening in nature similar to what happened to dogs. Right? They, it happened very quickly, a lot of diversity in form uh, in, in these stickleback fish, and we can map the genes that have something to do with that, those differences. Okay? And so one, I'm just going to show you one of those genes that's been discovered. Um, it's a gene called PITX1, right? and it's responsible for the difference between the marine fish and this benthic fish in terms of having that one pelvic spine, the one spine that's on the bottom of the fish. Okay? And what's shown here are pictures of uh, the developing fish, okay? 
And what I hope you can see is in, in this like dark blue color here and here is where the gene is active. Okay? So this is a picture of the whole fish. The gene is active there and there. And these are just blow ups of those two regions. Okay? So if at the very head end, there's activity of that gene. And at this place where that pelvic spine would form, there's activity of that gene. And this is actually a view from underneath because there's one spot on each side, the left and right side. Okay? So um, that's what the marine fish looks like. And you'll notice that there's a big difference with the benthic fish, okay? that this particular gene is only active in this region up here at the head. And it's, not, its activity is not to be found uh, where that pelvic spine is going to form. Okay? And so the first question I want to ask is, how do you think you generate a picture like this? How, how would you determine where a gene is active um, such that it's colored blue where the gene is active? This is not someone going in and coloring it, right? This is an experiment. So how do you think this experiment works that the gene activity shows up as blue? What type of molecule would you be looking at to study gene activity? Would it be DNA, RNA, or protein? Protein? Good answer. Anyone have a different answer? RNA, another good answer. Anyone want to say DNA? Good. DNA is the wrong answer because the DNA in every single cell is identical. Right? So that's not going to show a difference across different parts of the animal. What is going to show a difference is which parts of the DNA get made into RNA and which RNAs get made into proteins. Okay? So you could look at either the RNA or the protein to say which cells have this gene active. Okay? Do you detect the RNA from that gene or do you detect the protein from that gene? We already saw a method for looking at how you detect RNA for a particular gene, the microarray example. right? Okay. So this picture actually also is RNA. So how do you think that experiment works? So how do you actually detect RNA for a particular gene? What do you take advantage of? Any guesses? How would you find the RNA corresponding to a particular gene? Let's say I, I have a hunch that the pit X1 gene is important. I want to find out which cells are, have that gene active. How do I do that? What would you want to know from me if I tell you, OK, you better go do this experiment? What, what, would you, what would you ask me? What, what would you want to know? So you could look at the proteins, right? Um, and there are ways of looking at proteins, but we're not doing that. We're, we're trying to find where the RNA is active. Okay, so we, we're actually directly detecting RNA. So how, how might we do that? Think about the microarray experiment. Okay? So what do you do in a microarray experiment? You would throw this fish in a blender and get all of the RNA, right? And then you'd wash that, then you'd label that RNA into cDNA that was either green or red, say, and then you'd wash that over these spots that correspond to each gene, right? And why is it that if you did that experiment with these two fish and you only use this part of the body, why is it that you'd only get a spot that was, say, red, because you know, this is the sample you labeled red, and this is the sample you labeled green? You'd get that because this part of the body is making that RNA, and this part of the body is not making that RNA. Right? So you make, say, red cDNA out of all of the RNA here. You make green cDNA out of all of the RNA here. You wash that over the microarray slide. You have a particular spot that corresponds to this one gene, and then you would get a red spot because the only sample that has activity of that gene is this sample and not that sample. Okay? And the reason that works is because RNA or DNA pairs with its complementary sequence. 
So what is the spot on that microarray? It's a bunch of sequences that correspond to the gene. You know, it might be A, T, C, G, and if the mRNA reads C, I forget what I just said, A, T, C, G, C, G, A, T, those match up to each other. That's why those sequences find each other, okay? So basically, complementary sequences, whether they be RNA or DNA, find each other, right? You all agree with that. A's match with T's, C's match with G's, right? Okay? So you're doing sort of the inverse of a microarray experiment here. You're leaving the fish intact. You're not putting the fish in the blender, okay? But you're taking this labeled sequence that corresponds to this one gene, and you're washing it over the fish, okay? And what happens is when you wash that sequence that corresponds to the PIDX1 gene over the fish, it finds all of the RNA molecules that are complementary to it. Okay? And those RNA molecules are only in two places. They're up here at the head, and they're here okay? in this fish. And in this fish, they're not here. Okay? That label in this case is blue, okay? or it's an enzyme that can convert something into something that's blue. Okay? And so that's why you can see it. So this experiment is, is sort of the inverse of a microarray, okay? Because you're leaving the animal intact and washing what amounts to that spot over the animal, as opposed to grinding up the animal and washing its RNA turned into cDNA over the spot. So there's a little detail that I sort of skipped over, right? So one way to do this is actually to, to actually physically put a dye onto that probe that you're using, that you're washing over the fish. Okay? And that dye could be whatever color it is. Usually when we do that, it's a fluorescent color, so like a green or a red or something. Um, what hap what's done here is actually something slightly more indirect, which is that the probe is actually attached to a little molecule that has no color, but then something else recognizes that little molecule that brings the color there okay? through, through a reaction. So, don't worry about that level of detail. The idea, though, is that you can take this probe and wash it over the animal. It'll find its place based on where that gene is active. And we have ways of making that turn into a color. Okay, And the take home point here, of course, is that by doing that, we can see that this gene actually is acting differently in these two different fish. Right? In the fish that has no pelvic spine, there's no activity of the gene in the place where there would be in the fish that does have that spine. Okay? So the next question is, well, what kind of change in a gene does that? Right? And so there are essentially two possibilities. Either the coding sequence of the gene has changed, that is, the part of it that codes for a protein has changed, or the regulatory sequences of the gene has changed. The, the sequences, like in the LAC operon, the operator and the promoter, have changed to determine where the gene is active or not. Okay? So which is it? Is it the coding sequences or the regulatory sequences? Coding, regulatory. All right. Not many guesses, but the rights are sort of in the lead, and the rights are right, OK? A regulatory change in the gene, right? So the regulatory sequences are the sequences that tell the gene when and where to be active, OK? And that's exactly what's going on here. You have cells here that are deciding whether this gene should be active or not. And in this fish, it's active. And in this fish, it's not active, OK? So I just want to show you one slight difference between bacterial genes and our genes, or animal genes, OK? Um, and that is, if you remember what a bacterial gene looks like, a typical bacterial gene, you actually have more than one coding sequence controlled by one regulatory sequence. So if this was the LAC operon, you would have LAC Z and LAC Y and so on. And you'd have these sequences up here. What sequences would be here? The promoter and the operator, right? And that's what the control part is. That's what the cell is using to determine whether these genes are actually turned into RNA or not. Okay? So th there's a slight difference between a bacterial gene and an animal gene that's relevant in this example. And that is that almost all animal genes just have one coding sequence. They don't have an operon where you have LAC-Z, LAC-Y, such. You just have one coding sequence. But you have multiple regulatory sequences. Okay? And these regulatory sequences are usually called enhancers. 
when we're talking about uh, genes like ours. Okay, so that's important because what that means is that you can have different control sequences for different parts of the body or different times in development. There might be, for example, uh, the control sequence that's making the gene active in that front part of the fish, okay, and a different control sequence that make it, that makes the gene active where the the pelvic uh, spine is going to form, okay, and those are separable from one another. So if you mutate this and take it out, this one still works, and if you mutate this one this one still works, okay? It gives it a kind of modularity, which is exactly what's going on in this example, where the, the activity in the front part of the fish doesn't change, okay? But the activity here changes. And the way we think about that is that the structure of this gene is you have the coding sequence for pit X1, and you have one enhancer that says be active in the mouth, and one enhancer that says be active in the pelvic region, okay? And what's, uh, what seems to have happened in the benthic fish is that this enhancer has been mutated. It's been somehow knocked out. So that the mouth enhancer still remains. The same coding sequence is here. It's still doing its job, whatever its job is, up at the front end of the fish. Uh, but it's not expressed in the, pe in the pelvic region. And therefore, the spine doesn't form. Okay? And this is a kind of change that's repeated over and over again if you look at the diversity of different animals where it's these uh, control sequences that change, that make a gene expressed somewhere it wasn't expressed before, or that make a gene not expressed somewhere where it was expressed before. And that's how you get this kind of tinkering going on. It's easy for a tinkerer to say, well, I'm just going to leave this part out. Right? It's in my toolkit, but I'm just going to leave it out. And then you get a fish that doesn't have that pelvic spine. And again, the thing to remember is that um, it's not just the activity of one gene. This gene encodes a transcription factor. This is a manager gene. Okay? It's going to control the activity of lots of other genes. Right? And those other genes are the genes that would form a spine here. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. So what I want to finish with is a, is a very quick slideshow type tour of other neat examples of animals being used to study various aspects of uh, diversity. Okay? So the first example, and by the way, uh, the first few examples are all from this, which is part of your uh, assigned reading. It's reading number 10. Uh, the whole PDF of this booklet is actually on Blackboard, OK? So um, there are a bunch of stories. It's called The Genes We Share with Yeast, Flies, Worms, Mice, OK? And there are a bunch of stories, little vignettes, about people studying various genes and various organisms um, because uh, they're useful in some way. So this is an example of alcohol tolerance that's being studied in flies. And they use this thing uh, called a, um, I forget what it's called. I think it's called an inebriometer. Um, Basically, flies are like us. If you expose them to too much alcohol, they start stumbling around and eventually fall. Okay? And so what these guys did is they developed this really clever scheme for selecting the flies that were more or less tolerant to alcohol. Because you put the flies in the top of this device that's bubbling alcohol vapor through it, okay? um, and it has these baffles here. And normally, a fly will have no trouble just sort of hanging out up here. Right? But as it starts to get drunk, it'll start stumbling and it'll fall to the bottom. Okay? So basically, this is like a, a, a sieve for drunk flies. Okay? And so what you can do is you can mutate the flies, and you can ask, well, which ones don't fall when all the others fall? Those are flies that, are, that have higher alcohol tolerance. Or which are the flies that fall really quickly when the other ones are still tolerant? Those are ones that have less alcohol tolerance. And so, uh, this is a way of trying to study in animals the genes that are involved in our ability to, uh, to deal with alcohol. And um, so there's a particular mutation that's talked about here called cheap date. So cheap date flies basically get drunk faster. Another example, remember I think a few lectures ago I told you that we all have gills when we're embryos? Okay. The other thing we have is webbed feet. Okay. So uh, this is what you look like in utero. At, at one point, you have webbed feet. Okay? Again, sort of an indication of our, of our origins. Um, the way we get fingers is 
not that these five little buds on each finger grow out, but instead what happens is we get this mitten, and then certain cells are told to die. Okay? And basically, that cuts the, the hand into the fingers uh, that used to be connected by this webbing. Right? So um, that process of what's called programmed cell death, that is the choice of some cells in the animal to, to die at a certain point in development, is a really important process that happens in very many different developmental contexts. And this uh, article talks about how it's being studied in this nematode worm. Uh, another example that has to do with behavior. So uh, these worms have two different types, uh, social types and loner types. Okay, these are the tracks the worms leave, right? And so um, that's caused by a difference in a gene. And there are people who are trying to understand how a genetic difference actually lives to, leads to a behavioral difference like this. You can read about that. Um, this is a mouse that carries a mutation in a gene called OB. Um, and basically, that mutation affects um, a gene that produces something called leptin. And leptin is what your body uses to signal to your brain to say, I'm full. Okay? And so uh, in mice that have that signal lost, they, they get enormous. So this mouse is like five times bigger than its sister uh, because they don't get that, that signal that says, I'm satiated. Okay? Um, and so uh, this potentially has implications for humans, although um, it's, it, it's definitely a lot more complicated than sort of giving people leptin as a way to stop ap appetite, because that's been tried and it's not universally successful. Okay, you can read about that. And then in the last few seconds, I just want to show you that in this building, there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on. Okay, so the Desplan lab on the 10th floor of the Brown building studies color vision in flies. Okay, this is a picture of a fly retina. And they have two different types of uh, photoreceptors that, can, that detect different wavelengths of light, the same way we have three different photoreceptors. And so they're studying flies to try and understand how color vision works. Um, the Blow lab at, on the 10th floor of Brown studies circadian rhythms in flies. So this is what's called an actogram in flies where you can measure using one of these little devices how active a fly is. And what you find is that, and this is uh, two days in a row, basically. They're active in the morning. They take a nap in the afternoon. They're active again before the sun goes down. And then they sleep all night. Okay? So flies have the same kind of activity pattern that we do. And you can use them to study how circadian rhythms work. Um, the Rushlow lab studies flies uh, early in their embryogenesis and, and studies genes that are expressed in different, in different uh, subsets of cells as a way of dividing the embryo into its different territories. Um, the Christiane lab studies heart development in this urochordate, the sea squirt, which looks like a plant, but actually as a larva is a tadpole looking thing. So it's sort of a distant relative that uh, has uh, sort of most distant but still has a, 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 a backbone, OK? And so they study heart development. And you probably saw this thing, this little uh, heart pulsing in that organism to try and understand the origin of, of, of the, uh, the chordate heart. Uh, the Reese lab studies viruses that infect the central nervous system, so really difficult to clear infections that in, might infect your brain. They study that in mice. Uh, the Borofsky lab studies cave fish. So these are similar to the sticklebacks. This is a surface fish, uh, what a normal uh, fish would look like. And then sometimes these fish fall down into a cave. right? So it's the same kind of thing where this new environment presents itself where there's no predators, there's no light even, so they lose their eyes, they lose their pigmentation. Okay? And they're studying how this, again, this very rapid uh, and natural process of evolution occurs. Okay, that's it. <laughs>